hello, hello. Welcome back to my channel. In this episode, I'm going to be doing a book review. So here is Dagger Spell. Now this is a, it's an epic high fantasy by Catherine Kerr, my all-time absolute 100% favourite writer of all time. I adore Catherine Kerr's books. Um, this is the first one in a so far 16 book saga. 16 books have been written and published. There will be more. It seems to be a never ending saga. It's all one story. It starts with Daggerspell. This is the first book in the 16 book series. I'm going to have to hold them all up. Now, bear with me. <laughs> Here they all are. Well, actually, this is this is almost more than I can hold. It's I'm straining, I'm shaking, I'm probably going to drop them any second. I'm holding in my hands 15 books. These are the 15 that I own, that I've treasured, that have stayed with me through about seven different house moves. I love these books. I've reread them countless times and am currently working my way through them again. I'm on book four, about halfway through book four at the moment. Let me put these down. They're very heavy. Oh. <laughs> the correct order, the correct reading order for the entire story is Dagger Spell, Dark Spell, Dawn Spell and Dragon Spell. That's the first four books in the series, and that is the Devry cycle. Then you have A Time of Exile, A Time of Omens, A Time of War, and A Time of Justice. Those are the Westlands cycle. Then you have The Red Wyvern, The Black Raven, and The Fire Dragon. Those three books are the Dragon Mage cycle. And then you have The Gold Falcon, the Spirit Stone, um, Shadow Isle, and the Silver Mage. Those are the Silver Worm cycle. And then the last book, which I don't yet own, which was only released in 2020 this year, is Sword of Fire. And that's the one that should be on the top of the pile. I haven't got it yet, and I haven't read it yet, but that begins a new cycle. So there, so far, there are four cycles, or five if you include the latest book. And all four cycles are one continuous story. It would be very, very foolish and it would be stupid, stupid, if you were to pick up a random book from the middle and expect to be able to know what was going on. You won't have a clue what's going on if you try and read them out of sequence or if you try and read one without having started at the beginning. You need to start with this book, Dagger Spell. And if you're going to read any Catherine Kerr at all, if you're going to try and dip into Catherine Kerr, start at the beginning, read Dagger Spell. This is a very satisfying book. Even if you only read Dagger Spell, it will give you a fair idea of the type of story that you're dealing with. Um, it has a satisfying enough ending, but of course it is just the setup for a very, very long series of 16 so far books. What is their USP? The simple answer in one word, reincarnation. These are, to my knowledge, the only set of high fantasy epic sagas that use reincarnation as their central theme. I'm not aware of it cropping up anywhere else in fantasy and that makes these books very special. It's also a fabulous writing and narrative device. If you can reincarnate your central characters over and over again through multiple lifetimes over a period of hundreds of years of history, there is a never-ending source of adventure, excitement and story to explore. There are literally hundreds of characters for the reader to keep track of, and Catherine Kerr 
deliberately doesn't make it easy for you to keep track of them. In fact, you actually need to use charts and graphs and spreadsheets to be able to keep track of all the characters. And because these books are very, very Celtic inspired, they um, are written in um, lots of dense pan-Celtic language that includes consonant clusters with very few vowels. It's very hard to even begin to imagine how to pronounce some of the words in these books, usually place names and people names, and also the names of things. Magic, for example, isn't called magic, it's called duoma. That's one of the easier ones to pronounce. But there are place names like this one, I'll put it at the bottom of the screen. It's a very, very complicated word. You try and pronounce it, I bet you won't get it right. I think I know how to pronounce it. Umglaith. Yes, Umglaith. Umglaith. Doesn't look like Umglaith, but I think it's pronounced Umglaith. There's another one. Um, I'm going to make it absolutely clear. I'm not 100%, but I think the correct pronunciation of this word is Gwerkoneth. 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 Could be Guerconith, 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 Guerconith. Um, the characters have complicated names involving consonant clusters. That's how I got into the pronunciation bit. Um, and so you won't be able to easily remember their names. So there are charts to help you. I actually printed one out because I didn't like constantly flicking to the page in the book with a chart in and often the charts in the books only refer to the characters in those specific books but because they're reincarnated from other characters in other books I want to be able to see the entire timeline for each character and see each of their multiple incarnations um, on one sheet so I can see that this person who is currently Jill was also Brangwyn and she was Guenever and she was Lissa and etc etc I want to be able because it's all relevant stuff. The characters reincarnate time and again and each time they go through a new life they have no recollection of their previous lives. However, they kind of repeat previous mistakes. So there are character personality traits that carry over from one life to the next and theoretically with each lifetime they learn from their previous mistakes, they move on a little bit, they evolve. And in this way, over the course of 15 or 16 books, you get to meet a plethora of characters and watch them evolve, not just through a single lifetime, as you might in a normal book or in a film, but their character arc evolves over hundreds of years, at least over 400, 500 years. You get to watch these characters grow die, get reborn, start all over again, learn from mistakes, make a few new mistakes, tangle up their destinies a little bit. And it all gets very complicated and confusing, but it is so satisfying because a mistake that one character makes in a particular timeline, you can think, ah, oh, I know why she did that. She did that because 200 years ago, this happened to her and she's now reacting to the thing that happened 200 years ago, 200 years later, and making a bad decision as a result of it. Or making a good decision. Something bad happened to her, she learned from it. And 200 years later, she, in a similar situation, makes the right decision this time round. It's a huge concept and at the same time quite simple, but it needs a lot of work as the reader. You need to invest in these books as a reader. You need to put the effort in. You need to engage your mind. You need to be able to think and you need to be able to remember a lot of names and a lot of events and put them all in context because the other USP of these books is that they are not told in a linear way. They jump all over the place in terms of the chronology. The, the, the story has a temporal chronology, but it also has a spiritual and emotional chronology that don't necessarily go hand in hand. If you're prepared to put in the time and the effort and to concentrate and to engage your brain, it is a worthwhile and thoroughly rewarding experience reading these books because something might get set up in book two that doesn't get paid off until book eight or book ten. 
So you've got to read them all in the right order and then it all makes sense. And when you get to book eight, you go, oh my God, I remember that. That was the thing that got set up in book two. And now it all makes sense. It was worth it. It was worth the wait. And I enjoy the fact that I didn't get an immediate payoff. I enjoyed the fact that I had to work for it. I had to earn the payoff so that when the payoff arrives, it's relevant in lots of contexts other than just the immediate narrative one. So throughout the books, you get to see all of these characters make a complete mess and a muddle of their lives and the lives of everyone around them. And all of those intertwining, tangled up threads of life narrative get retangled and untangled and entangled in a different way throughout each book as it progresses. But eventually the strands start to separate and get back into their correct course. And each time one of these, as they're described in the book, chains of weird gets broken. It's a moving moment for the reader. It's like, ah. Oh. At last, that snarl has finally been unravelled. That's never going to be an issue for them again. They've solved it. That problem is now done. It's one ticked off the list. I'm astonished that no one has adapted these yet into a television series along the same lines as Game of Thrones or Outlander. Because if ever there was a series of books that needed to be made into a television series on the scale and with the budget of something like Outlander, it needs to be these books. If Outlander was successful, these ones can be too, because in my opinion, they're better. I love these books and I'm very grateful for these books. And Catherine Kerr, if you are watching this, I just want to say thank you very, very much for writing them. They have been my constant companion um, through my life. They've been my longest serving companion. I've had various cats. I've had various human friends more cats than human friends, I have to say. Um, but these books have lasted longer. They've been around for the longest time and they're family and I love them. Um, and I can't wait to read the latest one. Um, so Catherine Kerr, thank you very much for writing, in my opinion, the best epic fantasy saga ever written. And um, if you're not Catherine Kerr, but you're someone who has actually sat through the whole of this video, thank you very, very much. Do like, do subscribe, and do come again soon. Thank you very much. See you later.